Good evening, everybody. It's Pastor Jesse, just bringing you tonight's devotion. We are in the middle of Holy Week, and uh, we are looking at, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're getting toward the end of Holy Week, actually. We're uh, getting toward the end uh, of uh, the last week of Christ's life. And wanted to bring you tonight's Connect Point Live. Uh, it's Holy Thursday. Perhaps you've uh, heard of uh, Holy Thursday. Uh, a lot of times Thursday, uh, the last night of Christ's life, uh, the last week of Christ's life, excuse me, is called Maundy Thursday. It's, it's uh, a time of celebrating uh, Jesus' life, celebrating uh, his, his Passover, and uh, celebrating different... Um, things that happen tonight. Tonight, I want to look at a couple uh, events in Christ's life to uh, get us close to the uh, end of Holy Week. So before we begin, I'd like to just open up with uh, a prayer. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Father God, we just come before you right now. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives, what you are doing in us and through us as a church, as a church body. Thank you that we are focusing on you, we're focusing on your son, we're focusing on Jesus and the, the Holy Spirit this week and taking time aside to really uh, focus on him and focus on his death, but also on his resurrection from the grave. Be over this time tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So many of you are jumping in and... and uh, Hopefully you're having a good week, a good Holy Week, Passion Week. Started off this past Sunday with um, Palm Sunday, which is really uh, one of my favorites. I love uh, that we begin to celebrate the Easter season uh, even a week before. Uh, and really, uh, you'll, you'll hear this again in my message so on Sunday, but uh, not to give anything away. But I, I like that uh, some of the liturgical churches. The Catholics have this a little bit on us too, I think, uh, churches that are a little less traditional. We don't start with Easter uh, until about a week or so before. But really, uh, I've done this in my life uh, the past, uh, you know, for, for a number of years now, where I will focus on uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection uh, jumping back even into uh, Lent. Now, I uh, not being a Catholic, I, I don't feel that I have to stop eating meat or anything on Friday nights or whatever, but I do try to give up something. I cho do try to find something that I can uh, get rid of and not be a part of so that I can uh, focus more on what uh, Jesus Christ uh, did for us on the cross. So, some of you are jumping on now, and this is great. Thank you for being a part of this. And I uh, just want to remind everybody that tomorrow night, I will also be on live, but tomorrow night, I'm going to be with my entire family. Uh, we're all going to be uh, jumping on uh, tomorrow night and doing a Good Friday service together. Uh, we'll be taking communion again. So if you still have the elements that you had from this past Sunday, uh, at your house, you can go ahead and take communion with us. You will see uh, me and you'll see um, Pastor Andrea and my children. We're all going to be doing uh, a sing-along. We're going to be doing some uh, songs together and uh, also celebrating Good Friday that way. So you'll want to jump on tomorrow at 7 p.m. We'll be live again and uh, you, you won't want to miss that. So talking about Holy Week, let's go ahead and summarize a, a couple things. I'm just looking outside right now at the snow. It's, uh, it's, it's Holy Week in Michigan, and that's, that's how it can happen. But uh, Holy Week starts uh, on Sunday with Palm Sunday. And Jesus coming into, uh, into Jerusalem, almost as if he is coming in uh, to, uh, to take his rightful place on the throne. And as we know, he comes in a little differently than a prince would who's coming in, uh, want to uh, come in and I'm going to take over and I'm going to be the next king or whatever. And uh, Christ does this a little differently because Christ is quite different than most princes. 
uh, of, and sons of kings. Uh, he comes in on uh, the back of a donkey. Much different than other kings. You know, a, a prince would want to come in with, with full pomp and circumstance and the whole thing where everybody, I want to be seen, I want everyone to see that the prince is coming into uh, coming in to uh, uh, his kingdom, into his rightful place. And instead, Jesus comes in on the back of a donkey. That's because Jesus is very humble. He's a humble king. And uh, uh, he comes in with humility. And this is how he does it with everything. He comes in uh, into Jerusalem with humility. He comes into our lives with humility. He comes uh, wherever we ask him to be uh, through the Spirit. He comes in, but it's it's very humble. It's very it doesn't he doesn't come in and just destroy and uh, like some princes would to come in. And this is how Jesus comes in with humility and being a servant. And we'll look at that uh, as well again tonight. But but then the next day we talked about uh, Jesus cleaning out the temple and Jesus coming in and uh, he cursed the fig tree. Uh, and the reason he, he did that was because the fig tree was not producing. Uh, it was almost symbolic of Jerusalem and the, and the Jewish people not producing. And so uh, it didn't take Jesus cursing them. They, their own sin and their own uh, lethargy actually uh, uh, caused them to uh, not be able to produce. So Jesus wants us to be people that produce. He wants us to be a church that produces as well. Then we have uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then coming in uh, to Thursday of, of tonight is known as Maundy Thursday. And a couple things happen tonight. Tonight is actually uh, the official time where uh, Passover uh, happened uh, uh, with, with Jesus. We know that Passover started last night for the Jewish people, uh, and that carries on for 24 hours into uh, dusk and dawn the next day. So Jesus tonight is with his disciples, and this is the actual night where he has the Last Supper. He gathers them all together. We celebrated this on Palm Sunday, uh, focusing on communion. But this is the night that Jesus sits down with his disciples and he does uh, a communion with them. He, he breaks bread with them and uh, drinks wine. And this is where he uh, instills the Lord's Supper, where he said, This is my body broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. And he also takes the cup and says, This is the cup of my blood. Uh, drink this, uh, my blood shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. So Jesus is instilling the uh, Passover uh, for us to become the, uh, uh, the taking of communion, the Eucharist in some places. And uh, following this, according to John, Jesus uh, then sits down after the Lord's Supper, and we don't hear about this too often, but right after the Lord's Supper is when Jesus then disrobes, and in just a cloth, he begins to clean his disciples' feet. Remember on uh, Wednesday, night, I believe it was last night, where the woman uh, comes in and cleans Jesus' feet uh, with her tears and with her hair. And historically, this is known as Mary, Mary Magdalene. Uh, but uh, Mary and Martha could have been also. We, we don't exactly know which Mary it was, but nevertheless, there was a woman that came in and washed Jesus's feet with her tears and with her hair and putting perfume. And then the next night, Jesus does this same thing, talking about Jesus on a donkey and that servant leadership. Here is the king of the universe, the creator of the universe now, strips himself of his earthly clothing and gets a uh, gets down on his hands and knees with a rag and begins to clean the feet of his disciples. This is just a powerful image, powerful, powerful image. Because right after this is when Judas steals away. Some places will call 
tonight, uh, spy night as well. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Wednesday. Wednesday they call it spy night because Judas steals away and he sells uh, information about Jesus for silver and says, and come, come and get him tomorrow night. We'll be celebrating Passover tomorrow night. Come and get him. And Jesus knows this is going to happen. We know it because scripture says in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus actually looked around and he said, one of you is going to betray me and it's going to happen soon. And nevertheless, Jesus still, still washed Judas's feet. It's just an amazing picture. And then Jesus gets up and he says, will you come with me to the garden? Will you come with me? And when we say garden, it's, it's almost like the, the best way to describe it today would be a park for us. Uh, not a park with a lot of playground and play equipment, but just uh, uh, almost like Central Park or uh, a park that we can go to where it's just kind of nature uh, converging and it's just an area that's been uh, set aside as as a place where you can go and enjoy nature. A lot of big cities have these, and the, the reason they do is because there isn't a lot of uh, vegetation in the area, but Jesus takes his disciples now, found in the, in the 26th chapter of Matthew, and he takes his disciples and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the park, if you will, of Gethsemane. And then it says in chapter 26, verse 36 of the book of Matthew, if you want to follow along, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. So he tells his disciples, you stay here for a moment. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to pray. This is the night before Jesus uh, is taken. Uh, he's arrested in just a few um, minutes, actually. Uh, but here he is now praying, going off to himself. He wants to spend time with his father. This park, this garden, was frequented by Jesus and his disciples. There are numerous scriptures throughout their mission where they uh, come and they sit and they rest and they're there with um, each other in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a place that Jesus knew well. So keeping in mind that the garden is a place for resting. It's a place for resting. Jesus comes with his disciples that night to rest and to get away. Matthew chapter 6, now let's move on, verse 37 through 38. And Jesus took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And this is where we find Jesus has his first time of prayer. I want us to slowly look through the Garden of Gethsemane, where the garden represents something, a place for resting. But it's a time where Jesus is, is getting himself prepared, is preparing himself for the cross. It's a very difficult, difficult place to think about. I have a hard time it took me years and years to actually even write a sermon about Gethsemane because of this. But here is Jesus' first prayer. And he says, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus steals away from the disciples and he, he brings a couple with them and he says, Sit with me. And then he sits down and he prays, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Then scripture goes on in verse 40. Then Jesus came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me just one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is is weak. Jesus goes now to pray again, and he prays and he says, My Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, 
your will be done. And I agree with Elder Jim Murphy right here. The sacrifice, he says, has already begun. Jesus is already starting to process this and look at this. And some people would say that Jesus, what is he doing here? Why is he praying to not be sacrificed when he knows this is how it must be? Is Jesus, uh, uh, is, he, is he having second thoughts? Is he starting to question if this is something that he should do? And I, I, I have to sit back when I read scholars and when, I, when I've heard people say things like that, because I look at them, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> can, can you imagine what he is about to go through? Can you just pause for a moment and realize what he is about to do has never been done before willingly. No one goes to the cross willingly. No one does what he's about to do because he knows it's good for people. Is he having second thoughts? No, he's not having second thoughts about the cross. But what he's praying for right now is his willingness to get ready. The garden is a place for resting, but tonight the garden is a place for readiness. The garden is a place for readiness. He catches his disciples sleeping and he says, are you kidding me? <laughs> Can't you stay awake for just a little while? Scripture goes on in verse 43, and he came and he found them sleeping again for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again. And here's Jesus's third prayer. And Jesus prayed, and he said, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Matthew doesn't state it here, but Luke does. He adds that Jesus, under this intense pressure that he was going through, it was here that Jesus began to sweat blood. Blood began to come out of his pores because of the intense pressure of what is about to happen. And he returns to his disciples and finds them sleeping again. Sleeping. And he says, are you sleeping and resting again? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The garden is a place for resting, and it is also a place for readiness. But sometimes the garden is a place for rising. The garden is a place for rising. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's time to rise up. It's time to rise up. And if we can picture for a moment going back into the garden and Jesus sweating droplets of blood and praying so intensely, if this is the only way, if this is how it must happen, then this is how I must do it. If there's any other way, I will do it. If there's any other way. What is Jesus saying here? If there's any other way, if, if there's another way, is he saying, please don't crucify me. Please don't allow this to happen. Mm -mm. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, please don't let me die this brutal death. He knows it's going to be brutal. He knows because he's been in Rome. He knows, he knows how the Romans operate. He hasn't been in Rome, but he knows in the Roman Empire. He knows how the Romans operate. But he's not praying. He's not praying to not be crucified. What he's saying is, I don't know if I can do this alone. The disciples are sitting asleep. <laughs> his, his friends, his, his closest compadres are all sleeping and resting. And Jesus is knowing 
that when he goes to the cross, he goes there by himself. And Jesus has not ever been outside of the presence of his father. But the reason for the intensity of the garden is that he knows that God is going to leave him. Father God is going to leave him on the cross by himself. None of us know what it's like to be outside the presence of God. We can sin, we can do things, we can commit uh, atrocities, we can, but we are not outside of the love of God. But when a man takes all of the sins of the world upon himself, and Jesus does that on the cross, taking all of it, Father God cannot be with him because he becomes the embodiment of our sin. And so Jesus is going to be completely alone on that cross. And this is when he cries out. He says, God, he says, Father, he says, Abba, I can't do this alone. I can't go to the cross without you. But it's quiet. It's quiet and there's, there's no answer. So Jesus knows this is how it has to be. I'm going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And I will do it without my father. So Jesus gets up from this garden, a garden as a place for resting and a garden that is for readiness. And he stands up and he says to his disciples, it's time to get up because the garden is a place for rising. Get up, he says to his disciples. Get up, he says to himself. He didn't from hear from God. God did not speak to him. Father did not change his mind. Abba didn't change his mind so that he could have his son's life spared. It isn't a coincidence then if the garden is a place for rising that the Gethsemane used to be known as an oil press. At one time in history, Gethsemane was a place of pressing olives to get the oil out of the olives. It was a place of pressing and it was a place of crushing and it needed to take place in order to get the oil out of the olive. Tonight, the garden isn't a place of rest. Tonight, it is not a place of rest, but it is a place of readiness. It is a place of pressing. It's a place where a man desperately needed to hear from his father, and he pressed in to hear his will. It's a place that at times we need to go through a pressing in order to get out of us what he has put into us. He needs to press us at times to get out of us what the Spirit has put in us. And after the pressing, and I'm hoping everyone who's watching tonight, (laughs) after the pressing comes the rising. Rise up, he said. Let us be going, he says. Get up, get up. It's a time to get up. It's a time to get ready to produce. The hour is at hand. Rise up. You are about to see the will of the Lord happening right in front of your eyes. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. There is a pressing and we... 
We are in a season of pressing. We are in a season of being pressed and put down because of this time where we're not together. We're not uh, as a church feeling that. But I am saying to all of those who are watching tonight that though there is a time of pressing, there is going to be coming a time of rising up afterward. And we are going to see amazing things come from the church. We are going to see amazing things things that God is going to do in the United States of America and the world abroad. We are going to see a time of rising up because of this pressing. And this Easter is such a great time. It's such a great time for us to be together because though we are being pressed, there is a rising coming up in his church. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And we just pray tonight, Father, that you would help us in this time of pressing to be a church that rises up. That is a church that rises up and looks to the cross in so thankful anticipation of the spirit that has been left behind for us to encourage us and to bring us forward into what you have. And Father, I pray that during this time of pressing that we will learn and we will not fall asleep, but it'll be a time of readiness so that we will be ready for the time of rising up. And I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And that is what the Garden of Gethsemane was all about. <laughs> that is what it's all about. That our sins are going to be wiped clean because of the cross. And there's a time of pressing. But on the third day, <laughs> there was a rising and he rose up from the grave. <laughs> and that is the message of Gethsemane. And Lake Point, whew, I hope you hear me tonight because I'll speak it prophetically. But on the other side of this pressing will be a rising. Praise God. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I was in front of all of you right now in the church instead of the lobby of the office. <laughs> but hope and pray that the garden is a place of resting, that the garden is a place of readiness, and the garden is a place of rising up. Rise up, church. Rise up, church. Rise up, church. Rise up, church. Here we go. Get ready. Because <laughs> the grave is going to be empty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. I love all of you. I miss you so much. I wish we were together this Easter, but I know we can't be. But I would hope that you will get the Easter message coming this Sunday. Tomorrow, don't forget tomorrow night, we're going to be together for a word. We're going to be together for Good Friday. Bring the elements if you have them. Bring the elements. We're going to do communion again tomorrow night, remembering what Jesus did on that cross. Praise God. I love all of you. I miss... <laughs> I miss you so much. <laughs> I love you. Be safe. Be healthy. And I'll see you again soon.